hearing me. Yeah, well, it's 12, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. Um, we're so glad that you joined us. And so we have a great guest who I'm just going to introduce here. And we have Ms. Starlin Hayden Greeting. Um, she serves through SHG Clinical Consulting as the Illinois Pharmacist Association's Director of Clinical Programs and Population Health, um, which establishes community-based chronic disease and comprehensive medication management programs to improve person-centered care and medication optimization. Um, she specializes in pharmacoepidemiology and health economics and is an expert in the field of care, healthcare outcomes and research, drug use analysis and reimbursement with over 30 years of experience in medical pharmacy claims analysis and population health. Um, and she currently daily is working towards um, the recognition of pharmacists as providers and patient-centered care and strives to improve reimbursement as pharmacist providers with all payers. So we're so happy that you are joining us and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, and just a little admin note, I will be posting the CE information towards the end of the session. So just be on the lookout in the chat for that. Um, as well as I put my email, if there's any troubleshooting or different things, feel free to shoot me my, an email and I'll try to help you. But with that, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, let's get this on. So give me, you can see everything, my first slide. Yes, it looks great. Okay, awesome. Well, you already know this part. So I'm gonna warn you right now, I eat, sleep and defecate pharmacy. So I do, uh, uh, my job in my life has been dragon slaying for the profession of pharmacy. And um, so I, I don't, I and in team-based care. So I love the team, we can't do it alone. So I'm just, giving that preface out there. So I'm a, I'm a little pharmacy ha heavy. Um, I have nothing to disclose. And these are how to claim credit that you will also have access to. And this is more the fact that everybody on the team has uh, nothing to disclose. So our objectives are very straightforward. It's the objectives for your CPPI um, series, but I just interjected them into this um, storytelling that I'm going to be doing. I'm uh, somewhat of an okay lecturer, but I tend to um, move on to these stories. And uh, I and Evan and Teresa thought it might be interesting to hear historically the over 42 years of my experiences as I've watched healthcare transform. Uh, the profession of pharmacy and utilizing pharmacists in team-based care. Um, so she did a really great introduction. Um, I am very involved in trying to create that team-based care 360 degree effort around our, our person-centered care and um, specifically very involved in Illinois, but also very involved in many other states who need help. And um, coming forward with this new grant period from CDC, we're gonna be doing multiple states. And um, the other thing is that I still serve on some quality assurance programs. So let's, so let's talk about my journey real fast. Um, the reason why I talk about my journey is because it's very important to, lean in and hang on to the shirt tails of mentors that push you forward. So uh, one of my very first mentors is actually on uh, Dr. De La Fuente, and he was my first clinical educator. It was at, I went to St. Louis College of Pharmacy in St. Louis, and he came as one of our expansion of our clinical program. Uh, the Midwest was a little slow of doing things of what the East and West Coast were doing. We had great things at U of I, um, but uh, St. Louis College of Pharmacy needed to transition to that clinical process. And uh, Dr. De La Fuente was a great encourager, mentor, and um, I don't know, person to talk to because I was the oddball in my class. My husband and I both were uh, a, cut a little different. My husband uh, ended up going on to medical school. He was first in our class. And so we had, a, we wanted a different journey than what everybody typical wanted back in the eighties, which was 
Rexall Drugs was that they were there. Walgreens was just starting to pick up um, buying other stores. Thrifty Drug was a big, there was all different names. So everything's, the names, the practice was the same, but the names changed. The other issue in, in the 80s, 70s and 80s, is there was actually rules against pharmacists talking to patients about what their drug did to them. So that uh, got me riled. <laughs> and because I focused on drug information and we go to all the, we, you know, at that time it was a five-year program and, and we were working on adding that D permanently onto it, uh, the class of, I was part of the class that voted to make the D degree permanent through the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy. And so we wanted to transition that so that at the, we were going to be the boots on the ground to help educate and, and inform the patients about all these chemicals they were putting in their system. Um, not only in the community-based pharmacy areas, but all the way around. Long-term care was starting to grow. Um, managed care was not really there yet. It wasn't there until I did my fellowship. That, that's when managed care started getting really big. But we really didn't have a whole lot of uh, drug. There was not a drug um, reimbursement program built into your insurances back then. You 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 collected your um, receipts from the pharmacy and the patients themselves turned them in and then got reimbursed from the insurance company if they had that part of their, of their insurance policy. Um, one of the things that I was encouraged to do was I was very frustrated and um, the Indian Health Service had a residency program and I had already finished up all my clinicals because I did a lot of things on my time off and through the summer, outside of the St. Louis area. Um, and so uh, Dr. De La Fuente and um, a, a couple other of our faculty said, you should do the Indian Health Service. I was not 21 when I graduated from pharmacy school. I started school early. I, was, I had turned 17 my first year. And so Indian Health Service has uh, federal rules and uh, can expand. And that is when I got the team-based care bug. I drank their Kool-Aid. Their process and how they managed their clinics and, and integrated it with all healthcare professionals. And, and they had community health workers. They have people from the tribal area that came in and we all worked together so that we could deliver a product and a service and a support system for the Indian Health Service native uh, population there in Alaska, I, I I did some wonderful things, and it's a and it's the best decision I ever made. However, I came back to the Illinois, and my husband had gotten accepted in a medical school by that time, and he chose uh, the SIU School of Medicine. He was accepted at WashU, but their tuition was way too high, and he and I already had pharmacy school loans and. The, the SI, Southern Illinois University Med School was much uh, kinder to the pocketbook and also acknowledged the fact that uh, Mark had a full deg pharmacy degree. And so that first year he could concentrate on the things he hadn't learned in pharmacy school, like, uh, you know, uh, the matching the physiology to the neuroanatomy and all the anatomy. He spent lots of time in the anatomy. So I ended up coming out of residency and going into Southern Illinois where I was the first woman with short hair that wore pants to work at, my, at the hospital. And they wanted to start a clinical program. They wanted to attract um, surgeons and the pharmacy there was kind of operated like a community-based pharmacy and they wanted to be able to do and have IV infusion and uh, coming out of my residency I had already created that up in Alaska for one of the hospitals and so they immediately hired me and um, uh, the poor director of pharmacy just didn't know what had taken him by surprise so uh, once we once we get got through marrying a little bit. We got that all up and running. We survived a, a huge uh, tornado down there. And the, my skills of having been in a team-based care of starting IVs and giving injections and all the things I learned in Indian Health Service 
was uh, put to order and my husband and I were actually in the Marion uh, Gazette or whatever their newspaper for the med student and the pharmacist saving lives in the emergency room at Marion. So um, my Marion, my Southern Illinois people that are on this call um, uh, knew what, the, well, they were probably kids when this tornado hit, but um, it was it was a good experience in how to prepare yourself for those emergency care and how pharmacists can play a big part in that team base to take care of that. I uh, saw an ad in the um, healthcare journals where Memorial Medical Center and St. John's and SIU School of Medicine, because they do one year in Carbondale and three years up in Springfield, wanted a uh, clinical pharmacist to manage the investigational drug program, the formulary, and all things pharmacy in, in a three program. I was, I was going to bridge everybody. So I applied for it and, and was able to get that position. So I moved up early and started working on those clinical programs. Back in, in 1981 and 82, there were not very many PharmDs and rarely people did residencies. And so what got me hired, I did not have a PharmD, but I had that residency that showed all the things that I actually did in real time. And I, had, I still had a portfolio of that information um, to show them. Also on, this, on my side hustles, I worked for Facts of Comparison and I was uh, part responsible for getting them to um, program and get that into informatics. So we couldn't, we didn't have to carry that big giant book that turned out to be that thick around. And they hadn't um, put comparison tables in. And so I, I and, and five other clinical pharmacists were like, hey, here's all of our tables. Can you put these into facts of comparison? And so we all started working on, on uh, doing that and learning some programming so that we could program that. And now you have your electronic online facts comparison. Um, the, the editors of facts of comparison um, were uh, great friends. They used to have their headquarters in St. Louis and then uh, the two head dudes split over, over uh, one actually got married to somebody in San Francisco who was affiliated with that um, family out there and he started um the the one drug program the drug database program and then uh jim uh started me uh, med system and moved over to indiana and so you know i got to watch all these the movers and shakers do all this and absorb as much informatics as i can and then um why was that why was the clinical coordinator and eventually I was clinical director and then acting director, um, I had an opportunity to, I was working on a, on my master's degree and I had an opportunity to do a fellowship and rotate through the pharmacy associations. And so my husband was in his last year of residency and he was chief. I had by that time, a set of twins and a son and so if I was going to get to go do anything, this was the time to do it. I had a, a nurse student who was on call and was our nanny. And so when Mark needed her, we, all of our schedules worked out. So I would fly out on Monday. We called it the senator's flight. I flew out on Monday, worked all week and flew back on Friday. And I was a mom on weekends, except for the annual meetings that I had to attend for at least. So during the public policy, uh, program. I, I was there because we were just starting. If you don't know what OBRA 90, it's an omnibus act. The Congress, for anything to change in Medicare and Medicaid, Congress has to act on it. And so OBRA 90 was being developed. It wasn't completely pinned in 89. There were still, it, it was supposed to cover both Medicare and Medicaid. And um, the Illinois Senator, Paul Simon, was the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. So when I when I got out there <laughs> to DC, everybody was like, "How are we going to get in, How are we going to get any information? We're shut out of all these groups." And I said, "Well, um, my mom grew up with Senator Simon in Southern Illinois. They went to high school together." 
And they're like, no way. And I said, way. <laughs> well, they didn't really say that in the 90s, but I'm going to use that. Um, but so I, I called my mom who, okay, and we didn't have, we had intranet. It was all like you had, you could have a closed system. So many health systems and the Indian Health Service and the VA and the government had these animate, antiquated and animated um, computer systems where you, we could chat. It was just like a big chat box that you could chat back and through and attach documents to. And so, but, but if you wanted to call home, you had to call home the old fashioned way on long distance. And it was very expensive and for uh, people with uh, low income. And so I, I, from Senator Simon's office, I called my mom and said, um, mom, I have an old friend of yours that uh, you should talk to. And so I handed, I immediately, I was kind of nervous, immediately handed the phone over to my mom and Paul and her had this great discussion. And uh, she said, she, she, she told Paul, she goes, it sounds like my daughter wants to try to interview you for this new bill that's going to affect medic don't take my medicare away kind of thing and so she had her she got to do she's very politically involved and and so they got off the phone and paul goes i'm hiring you i'm i want you to be my health analyst and i go you don't have to hire me i'm already here on a fellowship he goes oh you're probably starving and you're not eating and they're not paying you enough so i'll supplement that if you follow this over 90 legislation with all these ins and outs of healthcare system. So I, uh, for that year, was uh, Senator Simon's analyst, and I was able to um, look at all the areas, and, and then if there were, the because pharmacy was being woven in deeply, both on the Medicare and Medicaid side. It wasn't until the very end of that bill that, um, because the public was concerned that because they were changing and, and adding some quality factors and some other things to Medicare, which, which eventually showed up in the ACA, people were nervous. And so they backed off and they took the Medicare part down, but kept all the Medicaid changes. So, and everybody was okay, good with that. And that's when it was required for dr drug utilization review by the pharmacist. And at the time we didn't, not every state was required a pharmacist to counsel on medications or even new medications. And so that was the biggest uh, implementation of that part of the bill. Um, while I, so I was able to write little snippets and then, and then APHA and ASHP and ASCP and AMCP wasn't called AMCP back then, but what I wrote went out to all of them. And then we were able to keep people up to date in the pharmacy world about what was happening on the inside of over 90. I, my biggest, my biggest win was the ability to, he asked uh, the former uh, United States Surgeon General C. Everett Koop to come to the office and talk about one of these final versions that we were looking at. And I was able to interview him. And yes, he did say, drugs don't work in patients who don't take them. And he did that quote, no one can own that quote, but um, uh, C. Everett uh, Coop, but many of us got, he repeated that quite a bit because in my view, 89 was kind of the year of the pharmacists as well because they were trying to integrate this uh, process because of all the work of Avorn and Somali, Samurai on all, all the impact of what pharmacy can do and, and all the adverse back. Back in 89 and 90, the adverse, the cost from adverse drug reactions was very, very high and that got everybody's attention. Um, but that also started, um, in order to pay for this program, they started the drug rebate program for Medicaid. And if you, if a um, industry, pharmaceutical industry wanted their drug on a state Medicaid formulary, they had to pay um, what they, what was basically a tax um, to to um, cover the higher expense of a brand name drug over the generic drug, and 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 from that um, things have rolled forward. Um, so the interesting thing, the entire time I was with uh, Senator Simon, he called my mom's name is Nancy. And he called me Nancy. Nancy, come in here. And so I, I would answer and I would go in there. 
But the most wonderful thing is when I came back to Springfield and they, Illinois had to implement this over 90, um, Senator Simon called, who was a Democrat, Senator Simon and and many of the of the legislatures in Congress were cr crossed the aisle. They worked very well together when we were doing all this. And and I unfortunately watched a change in that and in those politics. But um, when he had a discussion with then G Governor Thompson and Governor Edgar was going to come in, and and he said they were like, "What are we going to do?" And they go, "You have." You have a nice young lady in your backyard and he actually gave him my real name at that point and i was working in a community pharmacy um, for as a relief and i was sitting there i wasn't sitting there i was standing there checking scripts and um four four black suvs come in and then a limo drive up in the pharmacy parking lot and you know the secret service guys come out they come to the window and the, the pharmacy tech is going May I help you, sir? And he goes, yes, we're looking for a Starlin. And they were like, yes. Well, and they were like, they weren't going to answer because they wanted to know if I had done something, <laughs> which, you know, I could have, but not really. Um, anyway, so the governor came in and said, uh, I'd like you to be part of my uh, strategic plan to get this over 90 going. And that was supposed to be six weeks. And I was, I worked with, uh, uh, with Medicaid on the, on, on the quality assurance program for 23 years and under five governors. So anyway, um, during that process, um, cause I was 50, 50, I 50% 50 of, of my time, that was the deal that the state had with the feds was federal that, and we were trying to get the online claims processing, uh, going because that was the way we were going to be able to have prospective and retrospective drug utilization review was to be able to see the data that was in front of us and um, and the the congressional budget office was trying to crunch the numbers on this and Illinois was one of the few states that didn't outsource their claims processing even when it was paper claims processing. So we decided we could still do it in-house. And so we pulled all the big, big pharmacy systems together in a informatics kind of stakeholder group and talked about how we could walk this through and get it done quickly. And so my informatics background came into play and we were the first state to go online claims processing. And we were able to see uh, what these claims were saying and not saying. Um, that that was um, th that was an education in itself. So um, unfortunately, you know, there's bad apples, and so one percent of the population was still trying to game the system. And if you got a denial for drug X. Some people would put in a script for drug Y because it would automatically go through. And uh, when the when the when the um, system came up, I could start seeing those patterns. And uh, so we started we started looking at those. And in the meantime, um, I was able to. Um, uh, Dr. Aida Leroy and Lee Morse were doing a demonstration while we were having this. Um, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, um, we had lots of meetings there in Arlington talking about how we were going to implement this all in the state. And we all came in and, and, and tried to share our best practices and, 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 and consider the things that might go wrong, the unintended consequences. And Lee and Aida were make, doing a demo of their turnkey platform that, that um, did pro and retrospective drug and disease utilization. So I, I, I signed up for their demo and um, we got, I, I mean, had it not been for Di Aida and Lee, I would not be able to add pharmacoepidemiologists onto my name. They, um, they really were great mentors and teachers. Um, at the time, Brian Strom was working with this and I was the first Medicaid system to come on board to have them test our data. And when we, we could see what, the, what, when you can see the longitudinal data of, of a patient or a population of patients where you have um, the diseases and the 
and the labs and the all the medical claims all in one area, you can get a better picture of what, what the patient needs are and what the good practices are and what, what needs, what areas need help. And I'm not, I'm never going to forget that geographic arena. The other thing is um, we were able to show, we, we um, presented this back to the government because my part of what I did was subsidized by uh, Medicare, Medicaid, CMS. And so when we, when we did this proposal, we, um, the technology to optimize pharmaceutical care is what we called it, called it at the time, which is another story we have for another time. Um, we, we won the Smithsonian chapter uh, computer world medicine winner. And um, it was, it was quite an honor. It was very, uh, and ultimately uh, Merck ended up buying it and then Express Scripts bought it from Merck. So right now it is at Express Scripts and they're using a little bit of it, but um, that, 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 that tells you the, the frame of, I mean, I started, that's when I started watching all the vertical integration. That was, that, that happened about 1995 and 1997. Some of that vertical integration started happening. So that, this gets us all the way to, um, I'm going to hop up to 2005 because our landmark group project called you know, APHA and Asheville projects were happening in Asheville, North Carolina. If you don't know about them, you should read this entry. Uh, Marie Smith talk, has talked about it in Health Affairs. It's one of our landmarks, but it's not, it's not our, it's still not our best work to prove what we've done because mostly what we've published in is in our own journals. So Marie Smith, thank God, and um, pulled information into Health Affairs so that more than just pharmacists could see what how a pharmacist can help in that management team-based care approach of delivering chronic disease management, whether it's in diabetes, asthma, blood pressure, so forth. Um, in 2005, it, we merged into the Tensity Challenge itself. And um, so Barry Bunting and Tony Farah and, and Ben Blummel we did the self-insured um, employer arm because the self-insured employers, um, and I, I, I can pay their, have like their own, so that they have the, their own self-care um, prevention. Their, their, their monies are in little pots and they can put some money into that, that pot. And that's, that's where they can direct their own care delivery depending on what the needs of their population are. So that's, we got real involved with the self-insured employers because they were coming in to this process and not really understanding the vertical integration of, of the insurance companies and some of the uh, pharmacy benefit managers. And so we were trying to educate them early and, and utilize uh, diabetes self-management or cardiovascular self-management or asthma self-management to reduce those emergency room and, uh, or, and emergency room care or just over-utilization of, of things that could have been handled in an ambulatory uh, program with a pharmacist, with a physician, with the nurse practitioner. You know what I'm saying? Because the, the, the medicine happens in your backyard, it's regional. So the boots on the ground can manage that patient more efficiently than trying to manage them from a 50,000 foot cloud. And so this is, this is the, um, the uh, program and, and the results of that, that kind of uh, cemented that. Because the national um, groups on health, which were the business self-insured business people, publicize this so well, we, we got a lot of um, print out there showing what we were doing. So it was, it was, it was a breakthrough uh, for, for all, all, of what, all of what pharmacies were doing across the country in the 10 cities. After the 10 city grant was over in 2009, five of those 
uh, programs. Maryland was a P3 program. Um, South Carolina had program. Arizona, Illinois, Michigan. Some we all stuck together and and decided we needed to maintain and sustain this to show that it's that we can move further from the grant and still show the same cost savings and supportive care. And we you know we stayed with the one diabetes program. And then in Illinois, we called it taking control of your health. And then it's, we've renamed it. Um, so every time you have an evolution, you have to, you have to kind of rename it to readdress people. But in 2010, um, Ann Burns and Marianne Clothermis and Lisa Cranston, they were part of the Pharmacy Quality Alliance. And we knew that we needed to be part of showing quality of what the pharmacy services and pharmacist services were. And so I was asked to be on the PQA uh, Alliance and then they um, nominated me to be on the National Quality Forum, which is a clearinghouse for all uh, quality measures. And that was an eye awakening. What was interesting about National Quality Forum, we were on an interdisciplinary group and I was the only pharmacist. When we, when we review measures, we, re, we review them in pairs and, you're, and, a, and a physician is paired with a non-physician and you go through, sometimes you have six measures, sometimes you have three and we go through all the data. They have to send in all the data. And I am humbled by the fact that beyond what the AMA has said in their, their political uh, statements from their House of Delegates, most physicians and, most, and all nurse practitioners that I've worked with love having a pharmacist on the team so that we can contribute our knowledge and our capabilities and our operational processing to the to the team. So that um, it's out there, it's just that we don't advertise it as much. After 2010, um, and, we, and we moved away from the 10 City Ta Challenge Grant, we were invited to be part of the Department of Public Health and CDC's initiatives to embed pharmacists in uh, diabetes, cardiovascular diabetes prevention practices. Um, at that time, Bill Ellis um, invited me to fill in one of the um, AMCARE folks were, came down with the illness. So I was, he goes, just fill in and, and finish her, her process out. And then three and a half terms later, I was still part of the AMCARE board. But I'm very happy we were because we were able to revamp the BPS test for AMCARE to really show what was going on in with the troops on the ground and and test their knowledge nobody needs to memorize a website because that's what we have google for anyway so we we i would i'm very proud to be have been part of of that uh process okay let's so i've kind of talked all the way through uh 2016 2018 we did join the um, community-based enhanced service network here in illinois we we have about 40 community-based pharmacies that have uh, agreed to be part of it. However, Illinois is a state that is not easy to maneuver because of the high politics. So the big gorilla in our state is Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois. And they, and I had City of Chicago as a client and I worked closely with Blue Cross Blue Shield. But when I was director of quality assurance at Medicaid, I had to find Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois because when they were supposed to send in their data, they didn't send in clean data. Um, so there's all these things that happen behind the scenes that nobody knows about all these insurance companies. And some are very, very good and come forth. And if you find one that works with you, latch on to them and, and, and create a, a permanent uh, uh, relationship because in in the end the people that are trying to work and give a good product for their clients want to work with us all it's just when they think they're going to be challenged <laughs> in some way that they put up the walls and the lawyers so um now in 2020 
we have changed the name to My Health RX because we wanted to sound more pharmacy oriented, and we've been very involved in CDC's um, 1850. Well, start way back to C 1815, and now the new NOFOs, which have just all been released, um, have come out. And and Virginia, we're going to be all working together because the Virginia Department of Public Health also picked Habit New. To, to work because Habit News platform has an excellent billing and documentation system for DPP. And all of us, several of us have been working with them to build the D diabetes self-management education. And uh, we're going to, uh, they're working with ADCES. So every, so what, what we're trying to do now, instead of having cir disjunct circles, we're trying to do inter interrelated circles. First question. Of the following changes in healthcare, which is the most significant on pharmacy practices? And answer is integration of pharmacists into interprofessional teams. And why? Because we have now gone from triple to quadruple to quintuple aim. So the experience of care, the population health, the per capita costs, provider experiences, which includes all of us, and then health equity, making sure that we go out into those underserved areas and uh, connect and, and get care to them. And in that health equity, telehealth plays a big, big, telehealth if, is a general term and telemedicine in particular and telemental health. But um, the, the, Good thing that came out of COVID is the fact that we pro we pro, we we reinforced why we needed the quintuple aim. We reinforced that all of us can work together, and and that we need more uh, uh, digital connections so that we can all be part of that process. And we need a better broadband in our underserved areas, whether it's uh, an urban area that has too much concrete and the internet is too expensive for the average Joe citizen, or if it's in the rural area where they don't hardly have any bounce towers at all. So one thing that is important for you to understand that at this point in time, we, this should be simple, right? Why can't we just move pharmacists in, be part of the piece of pie, have embedded? Well, our, our health system is siloed. Our billing system is super siloed, and there's all these different kinds of rules that have, have happened. But it, basically, as a pharmacist or as a physician or a group that wants to hire a pharmacist to be embedded in your system to improve your quality metrics and your patient care, you've got to think about who's paying, where are you practicing and how are you paying for it? And this is a diagram that we put together for the summer meeting um, with Gloria Sechev and Melanie Dodd. And if you don't know them, Google them and read every article they've ever published. But this was part of a, I'm, uh, many of us put together a compensation and practice sustainability uh, committee through ASHP. And we got all these big thinkers and we started holding series of this sorts of explanation. So this information is out there. So this is a good, pictorial. Then I want to show you something the marionette. We wanted to put this in the ambulatory care book. And if you don't have this book, and we get we get nothing for it, all the authors and co-authors and the um, but it is a and you can get it as an ebook is a very good guideline, especially if you're just starting out on how you can go through the journey of all this uh, ambulatory care or clinical care processes. And there's definitions in there, but um, what I want to show you real fast is the how to optimize that. Medic this is our diagram on how you integrate and, and where we've come. So we have all these buckets of, of possibilities and we start from one end and go to the other. One end is immunization, medication adherence, and then it becomes more drug-related problems the more you move toward comprehensive medication management. Then our, so you see the dispensing services are on this end and, 
and sometimes having the dispensing services needs to be tied with the other drug related problems so that there's this continuity and you have access to the patients. And then on that drug related problem and that's where the patient provider education needs to be improved so that we have that complete pharmacist patient care process and actually everything is very tied together. So that was your comp, I'll come back to that. So that's, that's a very complicated way, but that's Mary and Clothermis and I were trying to figure out how to way to explain uh, the complicated process. And this is our working slide um, that we use. In the book, they made us do like a static one, but it's just more fun to have all, to show the, re, the, the regression and aggression of it. So question two, which statement best describes the current trend in contemporary pharmacy practice related to interprofessional collaboration? There's theme going on. And I'm gonna to go to the answer, increasing integration of pharmacists into collaborative healthcare teams, leveraging their medication expertise. So that I'm proud to say is now out in, in publication in more than just pharmacy journals. And we need to strive for more of that. So I just wanna show you my burden of diabetes um, because Vir Virginia has their burden of diabetes and um, the, the CDC, NOFOs for the diabetes care have been released and um, it's gonna be really fun to work state by state and interstate. So um, by five years, the seven states that have been acknowledged, we have to, we have to get uh, 10,000 10, patients referred. So we're gonna be working. So my, my heavy hold is down here in Southern Illinois, but um, all these areas are very rural. Now, Chicago applies for their own, and I'm not leaving Chicago out, and I work with Chicago, but Chicago gets a city-based urban uh, CDC grant, and they're, gonna, they, they're going to be, they've been part of it, and they're going to continue to be part of it. But So this is, this is what I do now. This is my concept of, of working within a state to get everybody's wheels going, the health system pharmacists the community-based pharmacists, the managed care pharmacists, the long-term care pharmacists. So what we have found and what I have found in my 40 years of doing this is everybody providing pharmacy care doesn't necessarily have all, it's not any different than with physicians. The documenting and calculating and making sure that, there's, that there are the quality metrics. So in a, in a physician's office, or in a, in a group physician's office, they have people assigned to help them do all this. My husband goes and is a doctor, sees his patient, makes sure his coding's right, dictates, puts those codes in, and then someone is reviewing his dictation and pulling off the billing information. So we're trying to simulate the same thing where I, the pharmacy association, which is we call it our IPHA pharmacy self-management programs is the, is, is the control tower. And we have all these advantages and arms that we can move into so that we can start expanding all those pharmacy services. So this is my concept, the aviation. I, ha I have to give Lee Morse credit for this because this is how he presented uh, the DUR program and he happens to be a pilot. And it made sense to me. I have my written pilot uh, exam I passed, but because I have migraines, they wouldn't let me be a real pilot. Um, but I, I, I play one on television. Anyway, um, so it, it, it makes sense because the, the boots on the ground are, and it's very similar in health systems, but the, the thing in health system, pharmacy still is kind of out there doing their own processing and the and then if the if you have loaned out ambulatory care pharmacists into the outpatient clinics then we don't have estimations um, on what they're doing and how they're doing it and we're just get, now getting uh, EMRs that are allowing for some pharmacy uh, documentation to be calculated but it's not always perfect um, so that's the other thing that we're working with we're working with Dock Station and Pioneer. I mean, I, I, I hold no preferences. 
if they want to talk about pharmacy workflow, I, I want to talk to them about it so that we can get something that fits everybody and that everything talks to each other so that it rides on the back of Epic and it rides on the back of Cerner and it rides on the back of the community pharmacist um, dispensing software so that we can draw information off of each other. So I've, I've come from collecting it all in one place to going down to where the boots on the ground are and letting them see their data before it goes to some payer so that they can make those changes ahead of time. Third question, what's the greatest advanced cl clinical pharmacist practice innovation designed to improve health outcomes? Should know this answer by now, performing comprehensive medication reviews and therapeutic op optimization. The next, this, this, I'm going through what we're doing in diabetes and, and you, your Virginia will be using Habit New. I thought you should need to see some of the aspects of Habit New have. What's really cool about Habit New, this is a group out of Chicago. I reviewed their, their, system software back when I was at Medicaid and had it, I knew about them. And when they, when they uh, brought their DPP program forward, I tested it with them and saw how they longitudinally measure everything and track each patient independently and aggregately. And then the billing goes straight to CDC or CMS and it's, it's a no brainer. They pull, they work on the eligibility. And this is the first program with the medical expert in mind on how to handle all this so that it's not so cumbersome. And so um, that's why CDC recognized that, CMS has recognized that, and that's why they're part of the payers. That's not to say that there aren't others out there. I'm just saying these, these people, these wonderful people were in my backyard. I, I had a relationship with them when I was at Medicaid and they came and we're willing to work through um, trying to do other chronic diseases, which is what pharmacists and in a community-based setting needs to be doing. It also it has it it works through to where we can put in a E scale and it and it feeds it in hypertend uh, the blood pressure cuff and the the diabetes all feeds into this application. What makes this romantic to health systems is because of all the hackers, it stands in its own little cloud, platform cloud. You can gather information from it, but we're, it protects the systems, the physicians groups, the pharmacist groups, any the diabetes educator groups. It protects them from getting hacked and, or or um, any sort of uh, electronic interaction that is not necessary or ransomware. It's it's a it's a it's it's a good way to separate that process. So um, this is what um, you will have access to in Virginia, and I'm very excited about that. Um, I just want to go real fast. This is our systematic review. I'm going to click through. You have these in your slides that you can read. Um, I'm going to click through all the way to the 15 studies that we included in the um, inter for I interventions. You can see Farah, who was the lead author on the Diabetes 10 City Challenge results in 2009, made it into the um, review. I what, recused myself from reviewing the Farah because I was uh, intimately involved in all the data behind that. Um, but you will see that um, ultimately, ultimately, the article, because it was, there wasn't a, so the first article talked about the setup, and then the second article, they divided the publication into two, was about the economic impact. And so it was hard for non pharmacists. So nurse practitioners, registered dietitians, nurses, physicians to look at this because we had the entire interdisciplinary team on the systematic review. It was hard for them to connect the two articles together. Only, only that Farah was the lead author. And so when you when they when we pulled the data, it was it was um, weak 
in this area, even though it's a landmark study for pharmacy. And my point of this is, and not just on this article, we, we've got to do a better job of performing this. One, one of the things is that we misuse the word um, cost effectiveness. Because it's if you really do a cost effective study, you're modeling the data, and that's hard for small groups of people in order to prove their worth in any of their services that they're doing. They really it's 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 a cost analysis is what we should be saying, and what is supporting your goals long way. Um, so not not just for for pharmacy programs, but I just wanted you to see how our landmark um, articles stacked up against others. And then in, in the study, because there were so many non-true cost-effective studies, and most of those are done by large health systems like Geisinger or um, Kaiser or Sanford or insurance companies, we took them out because what we were really trying to do is show the value of uh, diabetes educators, especially in team-based care. And, um, and so we eliminated anything that was a true cost-effective model um, study and just concentrated on showing the care delivery. Here's um, some of the issues and barriers in pharmacists in, in this value-based care process. We're still haggering over payment. We've got to prove um, our worth within the uh, being embedded in that team-based model. And I am I want to give VCU and your faculty kudos for um, uh, bringing, integrating this into all of your educational processes, everything that you have uh, demonstrated and talked about or your residents or students have published has been outstanding. We need to replicate that across the United States. Our quality metrics, we're in the middle of, of change in quality metric development, the application, attribution. We're just now starting to be able to attribute how pharmacists contribute, but that's because we have some of these new add-on uh, platforms that can collect that data for us so that we can uh, sh show that a dispensing system or a pharmacy operation system within um, Epic or something that is just doing the pharmacy operations doesn't do it. It's gotta have a clinical arm to it and making them meaningful. Virtual teams is, is improving all of our communication and also allowing us to go long distance between specialties so that we can work together for that patient. We need more access to that information um, and that's coming, the interoperability is improving. Uh, ONC just added um, Shelly from the pharmacy hit group to their group. That is a big deal, people. <laughs> Um, we also have had two uh, pharmacists in the Chicago area hired by AMA to work on dar their diabetes and their cardiovascular program. And so, there, so, so we planted these seeds. I'm just saying that these seeds we planted 40 years ago are, are, are coming to fruition. Um, making sure our roles and responsibilities and our expertise is known. Not a lot of people know all what we do. Um, we don't talk about ourselves. I was, you know, it was hard. I, I had to talk to Evan and Teresa and go, do you really want me to talk about myself? Well, yes, we do, because this helps our improvement of our process. And then we've got to unlock this risk-based risk -based model and contracting. And Stuart Beatty and all of us are, are really uh, going forward. You need to have Stuart come and talk. You need to invite him to come and talk. Um, he he has a new position, but he has been doing all the raggling in Ohio, and it's very interesting of what they're doing. Lessons learned, um, integrated team-based care is effective approach to complex patients. I knew that in 1980. <laughs> patients and their caregivers often um, are the ones that are coordinating care, but the medication, because we're siloed out of this um, sequence, it's, it's hard 
uh, to for them to understand and they lack ex expertise. And so we do it in an uncompensated care process. Um, nowhere in over 90 said, said we had to do counseling for free. So um, the be better transparency is coming. And I think the more transparency we have, the healthcare costs and quality will, will follow that order and help decision-making, but it's gonna be a battle because um, a lot of corporate entities have made a lot of money off of the healthcare system um, by hiding those smoke and mirror costs. And I've turned state's evidence uh, on some big guys out there. And um, so, we we we're, we're still there. The the people that I turned states of it against against new new politicians came in and and uh, pardoned them. So we found what they were doing wrong. We could have corrected it, and then they then they are back doing it again. So um, it's going to be a continuous fight, and we need to stand our grounds, and we need to be. Um, on our best behaviors. We need to be in a profession that is trusted and we need to be promise keepers. And question four is, which is the following best describes the role delineation of pharmacists and interprofessional healthcare team? And you know the answers to this now, collaborating with other health professionals to optimize medication therapy. And this is the year of valuing the pharmacists in team-based care and our pharmacy technicians and our pharmacy staff, no matter what site you work in, we're, our internal team still needs to be working with all the team people in those areas. These are my references and I wanna thank you.